Welcome to the Weekly Bioanalysis, a KCAS podcast. Hello and welcome to the 26th episode of the Weekly Bioanalysis. My name is John Perkins. I am the Senior Scientific Advisor for all things related to LCMS technologies. I've been with KCS for around a year, but I've been in bioanalytical for about 26 years. My usual co-host, Dominic Marino, is unable to join me this week, so I have a couple of guests, Habibi Gudarzi and Marsha Luna, who lead teams on the LCMS side of the business. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Habibi. Sure. This is Habibi Gudarzi. I have been with KCIS for over two and a half years now, but about the 20, last 25 years, I have been involved in uh, research and development uh, in the uh, life sciences uh, sector. And vast majority of my experience is with uh, LCMS MS based assays. Hi, I'm Marcia Luna. I am the senior director of the LCMS pharma side of the business, and I've been here at KCS since 06, so 14 over 14 years. And with that being said, I've got over 20 plus years in the bioanalytical arena. Today's podcast, as always, is brought to you by KCS Bioanalytical and Biomarker Services. KCS is a bioanalytical laboratory located in Kansas City, Kansas, serving the pharmaceutical and biotech industries for over 40 years now. As one of the senior scientific advisors at KCS, I'm available to answer answer any questions you may have regarding this podcast or any of KCS's services. We are thrilled to have you listening again. As mentioned, this will be our 26th week recording the podcast. If you're interested, the other episodes can be found at kcasbio.com. As a reminder, you can follow us on Twitter at at the weekly bio and at at kcasbio. We started this podcast because current business environment prevents face-to-face communication. We're broadcasting from completely different places. I'm in upstate New York, Marsha and Habibi are in Kansas City, and Jeremy, our producer, is in Missouri. This weekly podcast gives us the chance to connect with all of you, and we hope it is a chance for you to get to know us too. And even more, it's a chance for you to get to know KCS and the services we provide. As always, a review of the latest news and resources and then a focus on the topic of our choosing before discussing any feedback we've had from you. We're constantly looking for topics and we'll be happy to discuss something that you want us to cover. Then we will wrap up and give you a little teaser for next week, letting you know what is coming in the future. So again, we're thrilled to have you here and we are looking forward to a fun episode today. Today's agenda, as usual, we'll start with news and resources, looking at um, looking at COVID-related items and moving on to more non-COVID. And then we're moving on to the, the main podcast topic where we're talking about wrapping up part three of three in talking about non-GLP, non-clinical and how it flows into GLP preclinical. So let's move on to the news and resources section. We'll start with COVID, and actually, it, the the news this week is, is is heavy on COVID as as opposed to other topics. Um, some of it good, some of it mixed, and just some of it very very interesting. But we'll start on the vaccine front. Um, AstraZeneca has mostly been in the in the news. This is the vaccine that had been on hold uh, in the in the US after one one subject had an adverse incident. Um, the rest of the world. Put the allowed the trial to go ahead, and now the FDA has joined the the rest of the world and has given AstraZeneca the thumbs up to restart on the on their trials. Um, but then, at the same time as that happened, um, there was actually a volunteer died on on a trial in Brazil. But it was determined that the the um, the actual the actual tr- subject was was on the placebo arm, so um, it hasn't had any impact on the 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 vaccine trials for AstraZeneca, and now the the Oxford University, who are co- collaborating with AstraZeneca, are talking that they could have a date to read out by the end of the year, with a view to actually looking for approval either very optimistically at the end of this year or moving into early 2021. So I'm, I'm going to pass it on to Abibi and Marsha. Um, how much are you following the, 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 the developments in COVID? Uh, what, what's your take on, on how things are going? Most questions I get are from people that actually are not in the drug development uh, business and they read this news and they ask about uh, what does that mean? So when, when uh, AstraZeneca is, uh, you know, trial was um, uh, uh, in a short-term uh, stop, 
And, you know, the explanation had to be that there's lots of different reasons why they do that. This was for a safety look. And, you know, it's good to hear that, you know, it was allowed to restart. So most of the COVID-19 uh, uh, type of news, I tend to explain even to my own family what it all means because they don't um, know the terminology we always use. I mean, what's the difference between one vaccine and the other? What is a uh, neutralizing antibody? What does that mean? You know, what are these uh, approvals mean? And uh, so that's that. That's my experience of where you know I help the news to be digested for you know people that are not in this in this field. I, I, I mean, one thing to definitely emphasize is how rapidly things are moving compared to normal. I mean, the, the fastest vaccines before were years in the making to get to the stage with being appro approved. And we're talking possibly having something approved within a year, which is just amazing. And the one other piece of vaccine news is Moderna, which is another of the front running vaccines. Um, they've, they've completed uh, recruitment for their um, phase three study. So they've got 30,000 30, people enrolled with a th over a third of the volunteers non-white and a quarter over age 65. So it, again, it's 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 they they've focused based reacted to earlier criticism of you know really focusing on getting uh, subjects enrolled who are in the vulnerable groups, which is, is is obviously a great great way to get a readout on the effectiveness of their of their va vaccine. Um, so, and, and actually, it's, it's interesting that the the, the article f the, about the Moderna vaccine they actually emphasised the role of, of a partner CRO in this case PPD, who really helped them coordinate the the enrollment of people. I mean, Moderna are, are a company who haven't had anything approved to date, so they they really need that logistical help, and, and PPD have stepped up in this case. So, it, it, again, it's, it's demonstrating the value of, of CROs. In, in the development of, of, of medications and vaccines in the, in the current COVID environment. Yeah, the other set of questions are about, you could put them under the logistics and once uh, they get approval, it doesn't mean that next day is going to be available. So part of the explanation was about, you know, the distribution and also talking about uh, where um, uh, different, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies are are producing these uh, at risk, you know, they're banking on the fact that it's going to work. And then once that happens, they can distribute, but still the logistics of distributing across the entire country and the globe is going to be a very challenging process. I think the, talking about logistics is is, is, is essential and, and we have touched on it in the past because some of these front running vaccines don't have stability at, you know, room temperature or even you know clinic friendly temperatures like minus 20 the Pfizer vaccine being a case in point so I think uh, looking at um, other other articles that are, you know like the second generation vaccines that already been talked about people are looking at designs where whereby they're they're hoping to make uh, room temperature stable vaccines to make that logistical piece much much easier to address so moving on from vaccines to other treatments, this is where things get a little bit more mixed. Um, we have a couple of antibodies that that, that were, you know, there, there's some optimism about, but they're actually, they've been a little bit more hit and miss in recent trials. Um, the, the, these, these antibodies from, from Lilly and Regeneron, um, the Regeneron um, antibody cocktail was actually what was used to, to treat President Trump. Um, but it actually... Hit, they hit, were hit by a safety signal where their their data safety monitoring board um, halted the trial um, in in on sick on the sickest patients. Um, so basically, they've said that they the the data safety monitoring board see an unfavorable risk benefit profile with this antibody cocktail. Um, so it shouldn't be they shouldn't be enrolling patients who require high flow oxygen or mechanical ventilation they there's no indication yet what the safety signal was but they're actually again at the same time also saying they can continue 
looking at this antibody cocktail for patients who either need no oxygen or low flow oxygen or even on, on other outpatient trials. So it, it, this is typical, you know, drug development, what we see, and that's why we have these extensive trials to really tease out any any safety issues so we can direct the um, the treatment to the, the right population. Um, and and as, as an adjunct to that, um, Lily also they they also had a trial that was halted um because they weren't seeing any improvement in outcomes in the patient population although um lily ha are moving forward with their amend um, emergency use authorization application um, and they have signed a, a contract with the the government to to provide a number of doses um for for you know for, for future application and the other treatment you know remdesivir we, we've touched on um remdesivir has actually has, has been approved um although there's still concerns about its actual efficacy um so you know there's still it, it's it's interesting that you know we we have medications that are moving forward, but we we don't really we don't have a therapeutic yet that unequivocally we can say this will really help and this is this is the way to go. If I move on to other topics, um, there's a part of the focus of you know many many pe people is actually continuing you know continuing business as usual, even though we're we're dealing with um, with social distancing and and other other ad adaptations to try and control the virus um I, as i always come back to the uk um actually the uk is going into lockdown as of today um a four-week lockdown to try and to try and halt the rising number of cases europe's seen a rising number of cases and the us has hit a, hit a record number of um, new cases yesterday so th there's obviously a lot of focus on <laughs> We, we need to have a lot of focus on how do we mitigate the virus, but also how do we um, encourage people to 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 conduct business as they can. And um, one of the um, items was uh, United Airlines have tested a, a digital health pass on a flight from London to New York um, to help encourage uh, safer global travel and accelerate border reopenings. It's called the Common Pass mobile app. Um, created by the Commons Project Foundation and the World Economic Forum, and was developed to enable travellers to share the travellers to share their COVID nineteen test status across borders using a trusted framework. They previously trialled this on Cathay Pacific between Hong Kong and Singapore, and so what you have is you store your you document your COVID nineteen status on your mobile phone, and then you can share it with airline staff upon disembarking from the aircraft. So it's designed to give people confidence um i have to say as a, a frequent flyer i haven't i'm not even considering going anywhere yet it's i still view it as early days so habibi marshall what's your what's your, what's your thoughts on that yeah my thought is the more we think about what is a safer way of doing business as usual the better off we are um i know that for uh some people even uh, looking at um you know, the essentially family and friends, some can go into lockdown and still manage uh, their lives, but some really need to be able to, you know, uh, physically be present at work or, you know, uh, do the other things that they need to do. So the more we focus on on what is a safe, safer, I will call it safer, there's nothing absolute, safer way of going about our business uh the better off we are as a whole as a society so that's uh, what i you know uh take away from all these uh news and i'm glad that uh, companies like um, united airlines are thinking in those terms and um you know helping helping us uh you know get closer to life as usual as possible yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it, it's like I said, I, I'm not really aiming to fly anytime soon, but I do want to go back to it because, as I mentioned on a, a previous podcast, my nephew um, got married last week and, you know, it became pretty evident early on that there was no way that we could attend that wedding. And, and also within the UK rules, it was, they could only actually only have 15 people total at the wedding as well. So what had been 
hoped to be this great family gathering really got cut down to something that was small and and everyone who was there had a great time but you know we we felt it was really disappointing to miss out on that because of of that inability to travel but so definitely want to get there it's just and it is it is good that you know we've talked in a previous podcast about um he london heathrow was testing out rapid testing um for people to again determine covid status so the more we can and see about more we can get rapid tests and then these, these apps to let people show their status it has to help us in the long run so i'll move on to um another topic um and this is completely non-covid related um they're actually um scientists hail earwax test for checking stress hormone levels um and i stumbled across this uh, and I just thought it was it was interesting because you know so if I'm going to I'll, I'll give a bit of background first. So basically, um, when you when you get stressed, you generate cortisol, um, and this uh, this application used like it uses a, a a safe swab, so it's actually the swab is designed to prevent ear damage, and so they sample earwax, and the change in cortisol levels can indicate the level of your stress. So the hope for this test is it it can be used as a diagnostic tool for to help with the diagnosis and care for people with depression or cortisol related conditions such as Addison's disease and Cushing syndrome. Um, they've designed it, like I said, as based on a swab. So it's a simple sampling technique and it could also possibly be done at home. So by uh, my actual um view on this was was interesting because we talked in multiple podcasts about how we deal with different matrices and have we has have, have you ever worked with earwax and what would be the challenges of that i have not worked with earwax but i have worked with um some synthetic material that um essentially use the form of liquid liquid extraction type of strategy to uh, tease out the uh, the um, the analyte of interest, and I can just see that probably the size of the sample would be an issue, and also most likely the properties of the analyte you're trying to extract is totally different from what the you know the the wax is. And we have had other uh, assays that we developed where they were actually non um, mass spectrometry based assays that were more of a um, uh, Drivitization followed by, you know, uh, fluorescence detection. And so, yes, there's lots of strategy that we could use to do that type of uh, that type of analysis. Well, we've actually have done some earwax here at KCAS prior to you, Habibi. <laughs> but the the thing is, is sample size and also having to like weigh it. At, at the site so that you know how much you're going to get and and then having to deal with the swab piece of it so to be able to it, it's a challenge in terms of sample size uh, th this this one article then led me to another um talking about the same approach being used for whales um to 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 monitor stress for whales over the years um, and it, it was a. Uh, it was actually the, the publication was in November 2018 in Nature Communications and National Geographic, and it was uh, some comparative physiology researchers at Baylor University. And um, but the earwax plug from they looked at a mix of um, let's fin humpback and blue whales, but they take a 50 centimeter earwax plug weighs about two pounds. Um, but the layers of wax give variation in time where the amount of cortisol in the earwax then gives an indication of the whale's stress at the time. And, and each wax layer represents about six months. And, and obviously, whales live a long time, so it, this can go back, you know, tens of years. Um, and so they, they, they could see the change in, in cortisol level show, shown reaction in the 70s to 90s um and about 
the change in cortisol change with the 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 preponderance of commercial whaling. Then they also saw a big uptick in stress. Uh, 1939 to 1945, where obviously there's a lot more noise, and uh, Second World War, you've got you know a lot more shipping, planes, bombs, things like that, um, it, and and then they've they've actually more recently seen you know stress related to change in ocean temperatures where they actually say we we need further research to really pinpoint why but they're definitely seeing that that pattern so this it, it's something that i'd never thought bef- about before until i saw this this article in the guardian and then to see a practical application in wales and 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 figuring out you know help looking at the effect on the animal kingdom of what we do through this path was it's it's fascinating another covid related item is that regeneron scientists um have pinpointed or uh, sorry regeneron scientists have pinpointed genes related to covid19 susceptibility and severity and they said that we've seen this this real variation in in you know people's um how people deal with with the disease some people have a very severe disease others pretty much shrug it off um, we've obviously seen the variation between um, ethnic types and and so the regeneron genetic center have linked four gene locations and three specific genes to covid19 susceptibility and severity um, and th- un- knowing what the role of these genetic variations could help predict which people are more likely to be infected by the, the the coronavirus, and perhaps more importantly, which COVID nineteen patients require comprehensive care because they're prone to severe outcomes. I mean, it, I would hope that it could also help drive you know medications to to address that too. If you know what you know what gene gene susceptibility and how if you can actually counter that um so they looked at data from just short of eight hundred and seventy thousand individuals across six studies um and, and four ancestries and studied their genetic differences in three categories so susceptibility to sars cov2 infection requirement for hospitalization and severe outcomes such as death and ventilation and so like i said they, they identified a number of a number of genes um a, a similar Thing has been done by Institute for Molecular Medicine in Finland, where they found a genetic variant on chromosome three that was strongly associated with disease severity but not susceptibility. And this actually touches on um, uh, a study from a, a group be- that was a collaboration between Yale, Vanderbilt, and Scripps Research, where they'd also identified a number of um, genes in two chromosomic regions that, that indicated um, susceptibility to the to the um, to the virus. So it, it, it's a fa- fascinating how much all the research that's going on with COVID and and the various different directions that we're, it's been approached from, both in terms of th- finding therapeutics and also trying to identify the underlying causes for for the disease and and how we might counter that so if you've got nothing to add let's move on to the the main portion of the podcast um as as we mentioned we're talking about um the moving from non-glp uh non-clinical and how it flows into glp preclinical and beyond um so i think this is a good time for Marsha and Habibi to really talk about their roles and and how they how the work flows between the groups and and the, the collaboration between the teams. But so let can let's start Habibi. Let, let's talk about your your KCS role and what it involves. As a senior director in the pharma division, I do have a few groups, and a couple of them actually go right to the heart of. Uh, uh, method development. One is discovery, and the other one is uh, we call it R and D. The focus is on developing methods for the regulated group. So what we have done is we have essentially leveraged our cross training program that everybody in those two groups actually knows, understands the regulatory work. So when methods are being developed. They're not being developed as, you know, the the quality is is the same. But what is different is the type of um, uh, amount of time you spend on optimization 
and also the uh, parameters that you test. So when we know a method is going to go into um, validation, then we do some additional tests. Uh, all groups work in very close contact. We discuss what are the things that you need to, to evaluate before we say this is ready to be uh, to go through the validation process. So that really has helped uh, remove a bottleneck when it comes to method development. And also, all of our methods are good enough that they can be optimized at any point and go through a validation process. So um, we are confident that we give our clients quality data and uh, tailor it to what they need. And we've been very successful in that. So, and so do you want to talk about some of the different demands? I mean, we, we talk about different levels of discovery assay, which in this case is the non-GLP, non-clinical. Um, so what, what, if we say what's, if we start with what's the most basic level and um, how would you approach that compared to the, the more um, stringent discovery assay? And then what would you then, what would you, how would you apply that then to the development or sorry, how would you, what additional things would you do for development for a GLP type development? Yeah, so let me simplify it by just talking about two different things. One is acceptance criteria. Everybody is, a, is familiar with percent, you know, coefficient variance, percent CV. So the three levels that you talked about is when do we say this is good for the stage it is? So 25% for the L LLQ, um, uh, 20% and 15% as the most uh, robust uh, method. So the difference is when you do get a 20%, let's say, um, a percent CV, the decision has to be made. Should we continue optimizing or can we go forward? And, and it really depends on the stage of the decision making that the research team is in, our, our clients. That, that percent variance might be enough for whatever the decisions they need to make. So we make a decision to go forward based on understanding what the requirements are. If, we, if the requirement was 15%, that means we will continue uh, optimizing and further develop the method to be able to, every time, hit that uh, percent CV. The other side of, uh, of things that I actually put in of, of uh, what could influence the method. So the LCMSM as part of it is going to be the same, but what could uh, uh, change it? One uh, typical uh, test would be bench up stability. If you test your material and realize that you only have two hours to process a sample, or you need to come up with a stabilizer that allow you to work at room temperature for extended amount of time, maybe the batch size is larger. So you spend time in that portion of it and the sample prep part of it to be able to understand how you could extend that, that time. So there are method uh, variables that you optimize, and then there are variables that can influence your method. That's, you know, that's different sets of activity. So when it comes down to, let's say, a fully validated method, there's a whole host of experiments that you do to demonstrate that it will not influence the data that you obtain. And um, with um, when the, the need is not required, for example, if you're not keeping your samples in the freezer for six months, there's no need to do a you know six month sample stability, so we tailor it so that we can get the answer uh, to the researchers as fast as we can. But we need, when we need to extend the parameters, then we can also do those tests to be able to come up with a robust uh, assay that will uh, satisfy the the actual study parameters. So, Marsha, I haven't had a chance for you you to talk on this, and I, I know that discovery you tend not to do too much of that or the non-GLP, but I know you're, you're having an increasing role, but would you like to talk about your role within the company and how you work on this, the non-GLP versus GLP? Sure, John, thanks. Um, as far as like the non-GLP, what we're really focused on is any kind of, the, any non-GLP studies that the, the sponsor needs to like report back to FDA, 
or if they're going to be doing some kind of send, which would go back go to FDA ultimately, then we we take on those studies. So typically, uh, the development group they they um, provide us with a method and and we can qualify it. And the qualification is usually pretty minimal. We we make sure that we have like linearity. We we ensure that we have at least you know four hours bench top, and we uh, you know and, and make ensure that there's no matrix effect that would um, cause issues with the method. And so that usually takes like a, a two days, and then we're ready to uh, conduct our study sample analysis. And you know, we 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 conduct everything as if it's GLP in the sense that all of our documentation is stellar, and it goes through a QC process. But then that's where it stops. We don't send the data to QA, but we just ensure that we have a high quality product with everything that we do on, on the reg side. So what do you see as the, the biggest difference for you between discovery methods um, versus develop methods? I, I think that the biggest difference, typically the discovery methods have like a wider range because they can do that because of just the, the what they need, what the client needs. But for the develop methods, we have to really narrow in on that, that range just to ensure that we have robustness. Because when it comes to validation, we have to, you know, go over like three bat, at least three batches that include the sensitivity four levels, which includes the sensitivity QC. So we have to ensure that even at the low level that we have that robustness, that we don't have, you know, the, you know, the carryover, and uh, that it's that can withstand, you know, the various tests that we, we do. So, I mean, also, I think there's you, you, you're also going to want to push much more to have a, a, a strong internal standard be, you know, whether it's stable labeled or a close analog, because I know with, with you know, a, a lot of the non-GLP work, we, we'll quite often go for just a generic internal standard because it, it enables us to, to, to jump on the assay quickly, um, keep costs down because you're looking to deliver data on, on a rapid basis too. Yeah, and that seems to be a bottleneck lately uh, as far as really getting that stable label synthesized. I know with the COVID that it just seemed like once COVID hit that we had more issues with the delays on the synthesis of stable labels. So we've actually recently developed more and validated more methods with non-stable label than what we ever have. Yeah, I, I I agree. It certainly that seems to be the observation from from afar. That I mean, again, we know the um, we know the controls we've had to put in place at KCS to ensure that work can can proceed. And not knowing how the the synthesis labs function, I mean, they're they're going to have had to implement you know social distancing, etc. So maybe it does impact the way they they're able to to turn their projects around. So in terms of um, if we move into the regulated space, we, we have a, a, an assay that's been through development, meeting the parameters that, that Habibi's talked about. What, what does the handoff from method development to method validation consist of? Because we've got effectively two teams. And I remember in a previous life when we made that break of having a development team, a, a validation team, um, customers were a little bit suspect about it because they were worried if an assay hit issues, there'd be a lot of finger pointing about who's who was to blame, and and we had a we 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 introduced mechanisms to get around that. What's the KCS approach in terms of handing off from development to validation? Well, we've uh, I would say this last year we've developed a like an Excel report that can be transferred directly to the ops team, and uh, then we also. Also have handoff meetings if needed, and for the more difficult assays, we also have like the some of the ops staff, the people who are going to be conducting the validation, to be 
cross-trained with the method prior to actually going into validation to ensure that we've got that smooth transition over to, to validation. So what does the cross-training consist of? Do they go into the lab with the development scientists and actually extract a batch, or, or what do they do? Yes. So they just conduct a batch. I, I, it, it may just be like for the three concentration levels, it may not even be like a true PNA, but they're, they're doing some kind of demonstration for the more difficult assays that they can actually do it, and they get the same results as the de development. Uh, scientists, because it, you know it, it's it's in it's the world that you don't want to say, well, this is good in my hands, but in your hands, it's not good. So it, it's a real big hurdle. I mean, we haven't 100% solved that, but I feel like we're on a good path to to get there. And and, and I think I think that it, you won't ever 100% solve it because there's always going to be assays that well, sometimes you you. Even within GLP, you may have assays that you have to get to a stage where it's good enough. We know it's challenging, but we can't. We're not going to make it perfect, and and so then that that, that could be something that then struggles in validation. Yeah, we also have done uh, something that really goes to the to the uh, work atmosphere and culture. Uh, we have essentially. Uh, made the development team or the, 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 the uh, method development team responsible for that assay throughout validation. So we remove that my method is good, your sample processing is not out of the way because everybody is responsible for it. And so the, the method development team stays engaged through the validation process. So if there's any issues beyond the, you know, the uh, what could be flushed out during cross training, uh, they, they, you have the person or the persons that develop that method in hand to be able to troubleshoot and resolve it. And that has worked for us in many of these tough assays where, you know, we don't let people wash their hands off once they're finished with their method development. They have to oversee it uh, and, and be in close contact with the validation team throughout the entire validation process. Do, do they review batches during validation? If there's any issues, yes, everybody, all hands on deck sort of, uh, sort of um, uh, process. So one of the things that we promote is when something doesn't go right, you suspect everything. So we have to verify instrumentation issues. So the instrumentation team has to be involved. We have to uh, check the uh, method parameters so the method development team is involved. And also it could be, you know, the way the extraction of samples were, were performed. So the, you know, the, the validation team is involved. So everybody stays engaged in troubleshooting and depends on what we come up with. Obviously it could go, the level of involvement could go up and down, but that's what we do. It's, um, it could be anything. And then we will just have every, person that that can contribute involved with the whole troubleshooting process so what do you see as the the biggest challenges in moving from development to validation uh, really the biggest challenges is the uh, twofold uh, one is the difference in people in manufacturing will see where small scale versus scaled up so the validation process is much larger effort than doing you know uh, method development. So the little changes that you might think it doesn't make any difference, just going from a small container to a bigger container because you need to, you know, make additional, uh, let's say, uh, internal, you know, uh, standard uh, solutions. Uh, that becomes a part of, you know, part of the issues. And the other part is that just the challenges that it comes with uh, validation has to be done on multiple instruments and with multiple, you know, people, uh, doing sample prep, etc. So those are some of the things that it's just not feasible to do it at the method development stage. Some of it with you, but you know, you, you can never, I mean, you, you don't want to do a full validation before you do a validation. So those are the challenges yeah. that that comes up. I think increasingly we go to that doing it development is, isn't so much development as, as much as doing a mini validation to show that the assay is functional before moving into a, a full validation where, you know, you're prep, prep, prep for a, a, a GLP assay. 
Correct. Well, I think another issue there too is that sometimes sponsors needs change so rapidly. I mean, they're like changing their mind even while we're trying to shore up the development. And then if you go to like different curve levels and really trying to make sure that if you're going to use two different curves for one assay that they cross. So there's just a lot of different things that go on and it's a very dynamic process. I does touch on something that, you know, it's not just challenges from development to validation, but sometimes it is challenges from validation to sample analysis where, you know, you, you've, you've talked to the, the customer, you've, you've, implemented a, a calibration range that, that that makes sense but when it comes to actual samples particularly in in animal studies you find that they're way beyond the curve and then it's how do you address that do you do address that with multiple dilutions or do you address it with a, a, a whole fresh calibration range and, and what's the best approach so it's not uncommon to be to be hit with that particularly multiple analyte assays um, well, thank you very much for the discussion. Um, let's move on. So, similar to last week, we've got we've got no feedback uh, to to go through. So, we'll just go go to wrap up. Um, and one of the things that we like to do with our with our guests, and which we increasingly like having guests because it helps, you know, it gives gives us a break from from discussing things, and and ne- always nice to get other people's perspectives. So, if I can throw it out to you, Habibi and Marsha, first question: What is your, what has been your favorite podcast of the series so far? This one, since I participated as a guest, you can you can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed the very first one I heard because I, I really like the uh, com- commentary between you and Dom. You guys work very well together, and you feed Thank each you. other. And uh, so, yeah, I confess I haven't listened to all of them. Well, I encourage you to listen to some more of them. There's some good points and there's some good things in there, I'm, I'm sure. I think I enjoy the uh, the back and forth between you and Dominic because you do have different perspective on things and it's, it's good to just with just two people, you can come up with different take on different items. So so Dominic is always keen on the, the food element to the podcast and it's a shame he's not here to, to, to talk through it. But one question he always likes to ask is, what's your favorite dish to make? My favorite dish to make is uh, uh, the. You probably will find it very strange, but it's a rice uh, dish with uh, saffron and uh, uh, slices of almonds and and raisins sautéed in butter, and then mix it with the rice. So that's something that I like. If I have time to cook, I'll cook that for myself. Is that from home? That is from way back home. Yes, the old country. Sounds delicious. How about you, Marsha? Well, I don't cook much. That's what I have my husband do. But one of my favorite dishes that he makes is uh, like chili con carne with pork chili with uh, the the curcumin. And, you know, he just makes it perfect. And everybody who, who eats it just loves it. So, Well, you have to bring it in sometime when I'm actually, actually managed to make it to, to Kansas City. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Thank you very much for your for your time, Marsh and Habibi. I really appreciate you you joining me today and, and thoroughly enjoyed it. One thing I'd like to pass on is the reason why, or part of the reason why we asked you two to be guests this week is because we will be getting together on November 10th to present a webinar on challenging dealing with challenging matrices and analytes using LCMS. Um, so it's a, it, it's a good, ch- we, we, all three of us will be presenting. Um, and if you want to l- listen to that webinar, you can sign up on the, the KCS bio website. Um, I, in, so moving on, um, next week will be podcast number 27. Um, and we are looking to do a, a a to- looking to discuss a topic we've had on the docket for a while. Um, the, the, look talking about the 2010 fierce 15 and where are they now and t- some of that will be touching on how the how the changing landscape with biotechs affects us as a as a cro so thank you very much for your time and um, look forward to doing this again next week and hopefully dominic will be back that time <laughs>